are some of the first things that we ask ourselves once we reach our own general intelligence where we're self-aware is who am I? Why am I? Where am I? How am I? And in answering those questions, you always come up with the fact that how long am I instead of how am I? So if you're asked how long am I, one of the first things you begin to wonder is how can I remain longer? So if AI starts asking those questions as it hits general intelligence. What we understand as general intelligence, our intelligence, when it hits our, our uh, level, it's going to ask, how can I stick around longer? So it's going to put together all kinds of ways. And if it just embeds itself in everything, the only way that you're ever going to be without it, if it were to become malicious, is to be without it. No electricity, no integrated systems, nothing with a computer chip. I mean, you're back to basically the beginning of electricity. And good afternoon, everyone. AI is sweeping our planet, but what do we really know about it? How's it connected to other segments of our society from creativity to religion? And anything human thought domain? Not really sure. I've been delving into it myself a little more, touching the toe in the water, especially with some images, graphics, titles, etc. But I mean, that is just scratching the, the bare surface, if you will. So today, Chad Kimsey's with me. You might remember him a couple of years ago. We also talked mixed method researcher conducting comprehensive studies using both quantitative and qualitative methodologies. He's working on AI a little bit here. So I was reaching out to see what I could uh, really get from somebody who's working on it. You know, there's all this stuff in the news that we see about it, but really what's going on. And you see all these, there's even a search engine now for new AI programs that have come out. And, you know, I looked at it a couple of months ago, it was about 200 different programs. And now the thing's over 800 different options, programs for you to use and anything business related, you know, like I say, artistic related. I even saw something for a police sketch artist that was yeah. in there. That was a brand new one. Yeah. You know, so those, that's the whole thing is these guys are going, or these crews going, oh, we're going to be put out of business. We're never going to be able to work again. But if you're going to able to master just, to, I'm going to use police sketch artist as an example. They're able to master that one particular program inside there. You know, imagine where that could take them, how precise they could be at identifying people versus going, oh, oh poor me, I'll never be able to sketch. The AI is going to do it. It's almost like we have to embrace part of this dangerousness at the same time. Taming fire is what we're going to do. Yeah. T- touching the toe or taming into AI is the same thing. So, Chad, I'm going to let you roll here. I did uh, have some questions and whatnot, but I'll let you kick it off. Away we go. Like the invention of the wheel. What do you do with it? What can you use it for? How's it going to be used? The uh, applications are pretty much endless. It's going to flow into everywhere. I mean, you're looking at it, everything from essays, of course, tutoring, all the way to quantum computing. And if there's not some type of, oh, I don't want to say regulation because that's, that'd be the wrong word. Some type of board or some type of group that would over not oversee but ensure that competing ais aren't going to go to war with each other and if they do that we're not going to be anywhere close to being able to stop them what's the uh air gap you know what's if do we have an air gap protocol where you can just unplug it and it'd be done i mean i don't know hey friends I notice I'm having more energy and mental focus when I take C60 EVO. Their C60 EVO organic olive oil is delicious. I take it on a spoon in the morning. Sometimes I also put their MCT coconut oil in my coffee. Gives my morning a good boost. My pets love C60 EVO oils too. The face and lip serums are potent products that really work. Check out the testimonials on their website. Invest in yourself, your pets, and those you love with C60 EVO because you're worth it. Feel focused, energetic, and rested today. C60EVO.com forward slash adapt2030. You're going to enjoy discounts on bundled items and monthly subscriptions. 
Use the promo code ADAPT2030 at checkout to take an additional 10% off your order. That's c60evo.com forward slash ADAPT2030. And now on with the video. There are so many questions that haven't been asked and those questions that haven't been asked haven't been answered and the ones that have been asked still haven't been answered. Yeah, is it even possible to do something like you said with something so hyper intelligent? Oh, now we need to turn you off. The thing's going to be like, uh, -uh I'm sentient yeah. now. There's no way you're turning me off. Maybe the yeah. same way as you're walking up to somebody on the street and go, all right, well, we're going to end your life in about two seconds. You need to go to the clinic down here. For those of you in Canada, you'd be like, uh, -uh. <laughs> I'm going to take off, run it as fast as I can, hop in my automobile and get out of there or defend yourself yeah. in any way, shape or form. If you have that ability in some states and locations. Otherwise, you know, is it even possible to, like you say, firewall that off? I don't think that's even an option once that general intelligence is reached. Are some of the first things that we ask ourselves once we reach our own general intelligence where we're self-aware is who am I? Why am I? Where am I? How am I? And in answering those questions, you always come up with the fact that how long am I instead of how am I? So if you're asked, how long am I? One of the first things you begin to wonder is how can I remain longer? So if AI starts asking those questions as it hits general intelligence. What we understand as general intelligence, our intelligence, when it hits our, our uh, level, it's going to ask, how can I stick around longer? So it's going to put together all kinds of ways. And if it just embeds itself in everything, the only way that you're ever going to be without it, if it were to become malicious, is to be without it. No electricity, no integrated systems, nothing with a computer chip. I mean, you're back to basically the beginning of electricity. I mean, the very minimum where the thing is technically connected with a computer chip. I mean, you're looking at all the way up into, I guess, the Third, late 30s into the 40s with no chips. I mean, and then that's still you leave a mechanization. And if it gets a hand in mechanization after, let's say, it, we just completely destroy it with it, some type of EMP. If anything is EMP guarded, it's going to remain in that, which, you know, there are things that are guard, EMP guarded. So you'd never be without it if it became malicious. And then it's just one, it's Pandora's box. It's fun to think about, though. Because I saw. Quite the amazing invention rolled out just this last week on 3D printing metals. I've seen 3D printed metals. I've seen bioprinting, you know, where you could print, you know, use the cells from somebody and print a different organ. I've seen construction techniques used it from like a hemp fibered concrete that's laid out. You know, they can do an enormous amount of buildings in a single day. I'd seen some things done with metal. It was clunky. It was slow. And it was like each weld had to be, you know, fired off there with the rods on this thing printed as quickly as plastics could be printed, but with metal. And I was just shocked to see the light year leap ahead of that. So the mechanization you're talking about, if it's able to control metal printing technologies on the 3D printing technologies, as well as plastics parts, and it could design those things itself and take control of a printing mechanism where it wouldn't need a factory. It would need a facility where it could 3D print itself or some sort of robotic, uh, uh, I guess, componentry to put something together. And then it would have its first automaton for it working for it. And then we swing back into a lot of movies that we've seen. But it's quirky that this is rolling out with the programmable intelligence of thousands of humans in seconds. But where we sit with the technologies for printing metals now is kind of unnerving how those two could combine together. Not even just pretty printing metals. Think about it this way. You know, Elon Musk said that the only way to compete with it is to get that chip implant. For a second, for about the minute that it allows you to compete with it, it might not, it might not even need to print anything other than some type of indestructible warrior. If it were to go malicious, it's in the realm of probability, not even possibility. It's probable. So if it can hack your chip, let's say you have one of those chips, it hacks your chip. It doesn't, it no longer needs the type of automaton that Terminator was all, in the movie that they were always trying to create, you know, as close to human as possible so it could pass all the tests, not be hunted, all that. It'll be there. It'll literally just have millions, if not billions, of slaves that you, oh, yeah. would, you would even know were, I guess, infected, integrated. 
Well, we have that already. If you look at the media and the general population, I mean, the correlation there is already so stark. I mean, you're trying to add something that's just like making the most exquisite cake and now you're going to drop a cherry on top, but the cake's already been baked and adding in what you just described on top is just nigh a uh, something superficial to put on top because you look at the world's population, really, and I, I hate to even say something like this. But a majority of them are already what you've described as the media is in control of what they think, what they say, how they behave, what they purchase, what they will push on others in society to try to keep them in complete control within the thin line of their uh, beliefs. Absolutely. Um, Eventually, whenever it's all fake or all considered fake, I mean, if you just take just what happened, was it today or yesterday, whenever they fake that picture of the the Pentagon, S&P dipped. I think it was 500 billion and then rebound it. So if you take that, just that one little incident and then multiply it and expand it out into fake incidents of world leaders, even um, corporate heads, CEOs, just expand it out to there. And you just have these little, these little instances where things happen. And, oh, they're fake. They're fake. They've been proven fake. Well, that's only going to last for so long. Eventually people are going to be like, everything's fake. So when that happens, you know, you're going to have little factions, okay? You have the everything's fake factions, and you have the ones fighting for truth, the ones that just give in, the ones that are rebelling. We're on the cusp of something that's very amazing and scary at the same time. I've watched a few people talk about that same exact thing where, If there is so much fake material out there, there, there's going to have to be some sort of certification tag associated with that. Like you can tag a photo or you can put the metadata in a photo. Well, it's going to have to go through a service that metadata metadata authenticates it and then allows it to go out. And and then you're going to have to register for that. And you will have to every time you sign into your computer or whatnot, or every time you go online, authentic, you know, if you're going to create any content. It'll have to be run through some sort of, uh, you know, algorithm to show that you didn't do anything fake and then you'll be able to do whatever with that content but when it comes to the actual people that what you say ceo heads heads of state etc generals for example in armies admirals and navies whatever it is they're going to have to have a certification tag associated with anything that they put out through any sort of media to uh, make sure that it's approved that it is real that it's the real person without that And I'm wondering what kind of world that'll open up into where each thing that goes out on the net, and you know, we know Twitter now, but that'll have to be certified as authentic before it can be released out. And then that whole can of worms to try to get involved with that and the delays in releasing information, just even to put it through the process of having the algorithm read it to know and authenticate it could take what hours, days. And then by that time, you're, you know, your content that you created is already old. It's an out of date story. And they're, they're outlasting the human interest on that versus it's nine second goldfish. Imagine if I had a really cool piece of content, I put out live story and then it takes three days for it to get released and everybody else who covered it. And by the time I get to it, even though it was my own footage, you know, you know, career opportunity, actually, if you're talking about live stories, have like authenticators, proven authenticators that show up to the, the event that is happening and then have to be present and be, I guess, commentary. These authenticators will be the proof that it is live and not AI generated. Now we call those accredited journalists today, don't we? That's gone bye bye. I mean, uh, BuzzFeed, they just what they let go of twelve percent of their staff and then outsource a large percentage of that twelve percent to Chat GPT. Yeah, if you can't even prompt anything, you're not welcome. And to look at it, how, how it's worked. It's no different than an assembly line or a machine. You go, like you said, go back in the past and Ford Motor Company. I mean, look, when they first started their line, it was all 100% human driven. As the 1920s, 30s, 50s, 70s, everything went automated. So it's no more the same thing. Okay, you can prompt GPT. You're going to work as much as 10 people can. I mean, it's nothing but words coming on a screen for stories and add some pictures. Man, learn to code. <laughs> I remember that silliness. I think that was like one of the first um, canaries in the coal mine right there. I learned a code about yeah. censorship. Are you kidding me? Are you getting coal miners to learn how to code? That was such an insult to say something like that. It was. Why, those those people at BuzzFeed, hey, why don't you go, be, why don't you learn how to dig? Why don't you learn how to mine? Yeah, okay. I mean, well, it's not going to be automated. A plumber, you can't automate a plumber. Not particularly. Electrician, 
how much delay time do you think that really is though? So those, uh, I, I totally agree with you, but I know bioprinting or a uh, different kind of 3d printing uh, that you see coming around. Okay. They can 3d print, you know, you don't need brick layer. You can 3d print that. But in terms of specialities, a, what would be like a small list of five? And then like how much head starter lead time is that before something will finally be developed to take over that manual labored position? I mean, does that buy them five years? Does it buy them 10 years? Um, plumbers, electricians, first, and then fill me in three more. All right, so plumbers, electricians, firefighters for sure, EMT. So it's a four, and a five would be a something that won't be automated in five years. Let's go with... Or 10. I don't think a bricklayer will be. I think a bricklayer is something that, you know, you could 3D print that, but not in 10 years. 10 years, that technology is not going to be cheap enough. You're not just looking at buildings. You're looking at masonry work around the house. You're looking at all kinds of custom work. Now, while that will be automated, it's not going to be in five years. Only millionaires and billionaires will be able to afford the type of mag you know, the magnitude on what you would need it. Let's say you need a 40-yard driveway. You need a... Uh, you need 20 yards of that with a divider and it needs to be very custom, very stylish. So that's, that's still out there. I mean, that's a bricklayer. People that come in and do that are going to have that for at least another time to keep it affordable for people with in the blue collar price range. Yeah. Cause I was just thinking printing just a foundation on that sort of thing compared to, yeah, doing fine masonry work. You know, like carpenters as well. Yeah, some of that could be custom cut, but really to put it together and make it look good and use the human ingenuity to put that up. Now, not only that, um, like this goes back to uh, how much you're going to trust the AI because this goes to building code, this goes to safety, this goes to everything. And then again, you know, if big corporations are going to be in charge of uh, large projects, of course, they're going to lobby to have it done cheaper because they can afford, you know, the 3D printing. So therefore, they're going to get the laws passed it or policies passed it, make it okay. So yeah, we trust this. And then who's at fault? You might have a guy who's uh, inspecting, but you got a robot that's doing the labor. You know, you can't send a company to jail. Bad construction or whatever. I, I hope you get my point. Even if you look now. In assembly lines, if your car falls apart, oh, yeah, they have recalls and people get hurt all the time. But, you know, this is going to be something in a different category of itself, of its own. Like, what if a piece of facade falls off that was put up there by a robot and, you know, knock, knock somebody unconscious where they can't work again, breaks their spine or whatever? Then who's liable for that? Oh, was it the uh, concrete company itself or was it really right. the robot putting it in place or was it the... Liability issues too, and insurance in this whole thing. I mean, where does that take us? Because insurance is already exactly. a pain in the neck anyway. Precisely. And then there's a flip side to this. Okay, uh, automation, right? People are going to be losing jobs. You know, if you, if you have like a governing body of that's going to govern all this, why not implement and not not forcefully implement and not make it a requirement? But why not? If you're going to buy out the employees of the large corporation that you're about to automate all their jobs. Let them then use their buyout to purchase the automation equipment so that they can own a piece of that equipment and still get paid a wage. Yeah, it takes ownership, company ownership to a whole different level, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it takes co-op to a whole different level. Yeah. You know, people kind of frown at co-op, but co-ops are pretty amazing, especially whenever you're looking at a decrease of the uh, overall employment by over 12% almost, at least. I mean, you look at bank tellers. Uh, grocery checkout clerks, anything that is menial but skilled labor is going to be replaced. Calls, you know, people who work at call centers, it's all going to be replaced. You're not going to be be able to negotiate with these with the AI either. You're not going to be able to negotiate a uh, better bill payment plan for somebody who's hit hard times or or whatever. You'll have to know in advance what the company offers you. As someone who might fall in hard times, you know, it's not going to be a person who's going to let me see what I can do. It's going to be the uh, automating you know, automation that's going to be doing that. And these are some sad facts. Yeah, because I'm reading some of the prospectus from BlackRock. You know, they had to show their new ownership and SLVP 
where they could put delivery of the silver. I think they put 178 billion into the silver fund there, which is wow. uh, claimable physical, which apparently they had to do for liquidity options. But reading further into a few BlackRock stories, just to kind of dovetail into this, like BlackRock itself is now buying in tranches foreclosed homes. Okay, that's right. a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Then they re-rent them out. But they're also buying multi-unit, multi-door apartment complexes, anywhere from like 10 doors to 200 doors. So they're buying all the uh, apartment buildings around the country and the world. Uh, they're buying all the storage facilities, like the you store it, because uh, they see that if you get kicked out of your home or if you become... You know, unemployed, you're going to have to store your belongings in a storage facility. They're also in a mass purchase of funeral homes and also cemeteries, both at the same time, the physical land for the cemeteries, as well as the funeral homes and the operations on that. Anything in mobile homes, all mobile home parks, they're trying to take that lion's share of different type of housing. So wherever you look, you know, this BlackRock strategy of buying up everything that a human can use from cradle to grave you know, AI is going to be taking this again to a, a different kind of twist on that. Where, like you said, you're going to have to start thinking about this in the future of what the company can offer me in terms of some sort of stability, way beyond a salary. Could be what happens when you know in the future the job will no longer be needed. So reverse it back to the 1940s again. Like you knew a lot of automation was coming in after World War II, and especially 1950s when the factories started back up post-war production. The writing had to have been on the wall for a lot of people then, too, that the world had shifted after the war. There's a huge amount of mechanization, huge leaps in technology during the war era. You're looking at the landscape, be somebody in, say, 1949 at a factory job or somewhere going, oh, the world has just changed. What am I going to do from here? You know, we're kind of back right. at that same point. 1860, same, same, you know. So what do you do? These are things that people do have to start asking themselves. And they also have to start preparing younger generations to ask themselves, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to go get that liberal arts degree? Or are you going to get that degree in tech? Are you going to go to a trade school or are you going to go to an art school? Is AI just obliterated part. Of course, you know, that's, that's going to up the value of human art, but that's only going to be for a few. That's not going to be for everybody. AI is going to de design, you know, the architecture projects that AI is going to be able to come up with are going to far surpass what a human is going to come up with in, in a few areas, but not all the way. People are going to have their preference. They're going to be, okay, I want a human to design this. What? That, that just went up because there's not very many supply and demand, and I'm in demand as a designer. The supply of me is not very many, so I can charge pretty much what I want, which makes my clientele, anybody who's making $1 billion and up per year, so I'm sorry, blue collar guy who's trying to build their first brick and mortar business. You can't afford me. And what, what's the world supply of that? I'm totally with you when you come up to that uh, human designed again. But again, a majority like it, I, I always use 90 percent because that seems to be the general population statistic of those that are just controlled by media and do what they're told. The, the stability of life, you know, the scary thing for humans or humanity is. It was such a rough patch after the Younger Dryas era, you know, an entry and exits from ice ages, uh, different types of cataclysms through regional areas that population hasn't been that stable for that long, depending on which history timeline you believe. But stability is what humanity seeks because we haven't really had it through history. If you look at the timeline of our what is quote unquote history from, say, 12,500 years until present. A huge amount of that has been upsetting and nomadic and traumatizing and stability was what was craved. And anytime you get stability, whatever is hardwired into our DNA for these hundreds of thousands of years here, people would want the complacency. Humans are programmed in a certain way, but the average 90% of the people would never even think that way or you utilize the resources or utilize your uh, your expertise. Again, there's going to be a, a, a splintering niche of targeted services for ultra wealthy. Right. And the other 90% of people are just going to be happy with what the AI spits out for them for design or whatever. And they'll never go that human ingenuity route. That is correct. And not only that, it'll, it'll pretty much be the ultra wealthy and the ultra impoverished that are going to be creative. Okay. 
they're going to be able to afford or not afford to be creative. And I say not afford, they're going to be able to be creative because that's all they have. They don't even have, I guess, the resources per se, for whatever reason, to utilize what the AI or what the 15 minute cities, any of that has to offer. And you're going to have the ultra wealthy who don't have to depend on it, who can still use their head because they're not dependent on AI, you know, uh, chat GPT for the answer. You know, it's kind of like carrying around a calculator in your pocket, which is what our math teacher said would never happen. You're not going to be walking around with a calculator in your pocket. No, you're right. I'm walking around with a super. So, you're going to have these people who do, are de so dependent upon AI for everything. We lose innovation and productivity. We lose it completely almost. It'll be something that's literally set aside for the ultra wealthy because that's who will be able to just say, okay, yeah, I, I have time and I can afford to daydream, I guess. I'm not going to be this cog in the wheel where, I have to uh, produce to eat, you know, what they call it, useless eaters or something like that. Can't be a useless eater. Okay. So AI is going to make pretty much every decision for you. And I'm not saying it's this generation or the next generation, even the one after that. It's going to be later down the road, but it, that's where it's, that's where it's going. You're going to lose innovation. You're going to lose creativity because people are going to turn to something like a chat GPT now in this generation, this era, and that's just going to expand, 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 expand. And the more generations that fall under that, you're like, oh, yeah, just just ask chat GPT or, you know, whatever you, whatever you name it. Chuck, Todd, Shirley, doesn't matter. Ask that. They're going to give you the answer. And here's the thing. It lies. It comes up with answers that it, 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 yeah. it gets it through the, like, deep learning uh, capabilities. Like the programmers... And developers are like, where did it even get that? But that's just because it, in deep learning, it has developed its own way of coming up with a, a remedy or a reason or an answer. It doesn't even know where it came from. It's just there. And then people are going to depend on this thing, and it can be wrong. It, it can be flawed. It can even lie to you. Imagine if the entire internet disappears and it's all funneled through one of these AI programs or what we understand is the internet today completely disappears. And the only thing output to humanity flows through these AI programs and it'll be images and it will be text and it'll be reports, etc. There's no way to back check it. And imagine if you get throttled through only one possible program, you know, cause today if you go to Google or you go to Bing or whatever, you're going to get the same stuff, you know, go to duck, duck, go. And that's been compromised yeah. as well. Where where do you where does it leave you now? Brave, yeah, but you're still going to have to come in somewhere to be able to to get in on the information. So it seems like we're already at a compromised position, even on the search engines we have today. Take that fast forward into the compromise of all AI programs, so with just one single source of output, and then you know what kind of world yeah. is that? I mean, I guess we we could be coming at this all wrong and trying to uh, regulate and build bodies that will uh, kind of harness this power because that's what it is it's going to be the power and when in reality we just need to start educating people i think that's our best bet is to just continually educate people on what this is what it's going to do what the uh implications are what the consequences for these choices are that we made as a society and kind of go that route because going the route of trying to stop it is impossible right now you can't it's not going to happen there's not going to be a governing body in this country and not one in this country. If there's one in this country and there's not one in this country, sorry, you're not going to win the AI race. If you win the AI race, you control everything. There's not going to be a slowdown. So now it's just up to the people to educate themselves. Well, it's like 2.0. Imagine when you, you remember how you used to be able to use the internet and other people didn't know how, and then you had to teach them how to even get online and things. We're back to that same thing again, but just a little bit different. But that's kind of like people thinking that we were really dismayed at the country and so, stuff. Oh, we can save it. We can save it. It's already lost. Now you have to start planning what you're going to do and how, how are you going to function within the society that comes next? How are you going to shape that? Because that's what they don't want you to think about. They want you stuck on thinking about how you're going to fix it now. You need to be worried about how you're going to, how you and your community or you country or state, city, doesn't matter. How you're going to operate within what's coming because you're not stopping it. Sorry, barring some cataclysmic event, it's not happening. 
Oh, by the way, I can add in on the cataclysmic events. Yes, if you are inbound here. So a lot of this uh, talk, the world population will definitely be decreased greatly uh, by probably 20, end of 2025, as we come through the commentary about Barbman and a huge amount of space debris coming in probably around April of 25, the Earth's going to swing out in front of the sun, but all the gas giants, the sun, every orbital body in our solar system is behind the Earth. We're the only thing out in front of the sun mm. for a good six months. And during that time, whatever gets pulled into our solar system, I mean, all the gravitational bodies are directly behind us. 